Good morning everyone, this is Yolanda. Um, I'm here at St. John's Cathedral and we are here to support that crazy rector, Father Nicholas. So let's head up there, go and see what he's doing. Maybe I can bribe him with some coffee. Come on, let's go. Page for sure, I can tell you Start that. By acknowledging the Turbo Yagara people and their hospitality to us, not that we really appreciated that for centuries, but anyway, and also uh, acknowledging the hospitality of St John's Cathedral community and the support that I've received from them. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, my wife and I and our three children lived in Brazil. For me, the experience of, I mean, we chose to go, Brett and I, uh, but the experience of learning a new language, learning a culture that was different in many respects. So you're trying to, uh, trying to learn, trying to recognize the culture of that place but it's difficult so part of that experience but you know people coming to australia or whatever foreign countries refugees and asylum seekers they don't always have all the good right papers like i did they don't have the financial support like i did always they don't have the press support like i did always mm. and has just magnifies the hardness of it. So that was part of, for me, what increased my empathy. The, the other thing that I particularly noticed in Brazil was that all these people were poor. I mean, I couldn't imagine living in some of the conditions of some of the people that we used to visit. These people were fleeing Brazil. They were living there, often relatively happy that made me realise people flee their country out of sheer fear of violence, the fear to their, how their wife or their children might be treated. Oh, it's so overwhelming that they run away from their home. Our family, myself, my wife and our, our little girl, we went to um, the border of Thailand and Burma. I was a far, I'm a pharmacist, so I went there as a, as a volunteer from Australia. And the first time I was exposed to the desperation of refugees who were from from the border, um, stateless practically, and no, some of the kids didn't have birth certificates because there's no state to be registered with. That was the first time really when I was exposed firsthand to, to people seeking asylum. And as a health professional, it was a, it was a real challenge to, to kind of find any resources that we could to, to help. And so when I came back to Australia, um, I discovered a group called Love Makes Away who were advocating for the rights of people seeking asylum who were a Christian group. Um, and it was at the stage of my life when my faith really needed to, I suppose, break out of the four walls of the church and actually, like Christ did, actually get out onto the streets and, and live my faith. I remember um, meeting Father Nick for the first time in, in Strathpine where we um, had a prayer vigil with with Love Makes a Way outside a politician's office who was um, immigration minister at the time and we we really, um, you know, both of us are not confrontational kind of people, not very shouty, um, but we were desperate also for, for those people's lives to be, to be, to be, uh, well, for their nice. stories to be heard, you know. Recognized. And here we are in front of this beautiful cathedral, you know, in a makeshift, um, basically and already we've seen people stop by and, and kind of noticing hey what's going on and then learning more about the situation and I think that's what it takes you know for people like us who may not be very comfortable in doing this sort of thing but but I think we can all do something and I think uh, for people to more people to know about it and they can speak to their friends and families and their churches and also their, their elected leaders who do have the power to actually let these people live a life that's that's fair and that's um, we're all deserving of as children of God. The importance of the nine days is to speak about nine years of people caught up in the 
offshore processing system. It's about living the faith and the Christian faith and, and indeed actually many different faith traditions have a deep commitment to hospitality and and you know the Hebrew scriptures you read where Abraham and Sarah welcomed three strangers. They didn't know who they were mm. but in that process they realised that they've been visited by God. Mm. Jesus reminds us, what does it mean to love your neighbour? Just to go out of your way for someone who's different but who's in need and surround them with love. And we often project onto others some kind of badness. But actually, when we encounter them, as Peter's been mm. saying, we encounter beautiful people. And, mm. and you know, one of the students that I was able to work with as an examining chaplain came from Sudan and, and uh, you know, she's now an Anglican priest here in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. So effectively I'm camping inside the cathedral which is rather pleasant because I can go for walks in the evening and the morning around the cathedral and be just kind of imagine Samuel in the temple and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, but I often wake up quite early and I go over to the bathroom just here. I say bathroom, it's really a toilet, and, uh, and, but there is sinks there you can wash and I'm able to sort of have a shave or take some hot water over because there's no hot water there and, and have a shave and a bit of a wash and wash my hair and what have you. And, and as Jesus said, put oil on your face so you're not looking like you're fading away or something. Then it's time really to bring my cage, my little detention centre out here onto the, the, above the kind of steps of the cathedral. Sometimes it's been the homeless people who've helped move it in or bring it out. Um, they've helped me very graciously, giving me, one man, a, a really warm sleeping bag. So that's very, a huge blessing. And uh, so then basically from about six o'clock in the morning, I'm out here and I have a time of meditation about quarter past seven and then get my laptop out and have morning prayer at eight o'clock and people can join us on Zoom and one or two join me here. Um, and then I sit and people just come, many of them from the church here and sit with me and have a chat. And then the afternoon gets a little bit quieter, I try journaling but I find that that gets broken up by some other thing that happens. In the evening, I even have a meditation before evening prayer, which is at five o'clock, or last night after I'd finished out here on the steps, I went inside and joined the, the community in here for meditation at quarter to seven, so that was really lovely. But yeah, and again, evening prayer on Zoom, so people have had people from Sydney and Melbourne joining us on Zoom and Toowoomba here in Brisbane. Yeah, about 6 p.m. we bring everything inside. People are being very gracious not bringing their lunch with them when they come to visit, but um, conscious that I am fasting. We've been so well supported and people on Zoom or people here visiting, it's been a real encouragement. Um, I've only had one or two people who kind of pushed back a bit and, and found it very difficult. This fast, this prayer vigil has been about three things. So it's about, um, well, basically giving real and, and um, permanent solutions for those who are stuck on the offshore processing. Uh, many of them have been there for almost a decade now. There are solutions to be, to be implemented and our leaders, our, our politicians can actually make that happen. The second one is like my friends who have been released from, from the detention centres in, in Australia and, and those who have been brought from, from offshore are now here, a part of our community, they're trying to get on with their lives, they're trying to get jobs, they want to be contributing members of our society and yet they're only being given temporary protection, which like for my, my friend, that's every six months, he's got to reapply. Other people have three years, other people have five years. A petition that we've been promoting 
which is um, <clears throat> was done by a group called Justice for Refugees, who are actually a refugee-led um, organization for, for permanent visas for refugees, because a lot of the issues like homelessness and, and poverty come from the fact that they don't have permanent visas, and it's very hard for them to take roots and you know, put, uh, plan their lives and also really put their lives back together. I mean, at the moment, we need workers. So we want people to stay, we want people to contribute to our society. And the third thing is being, you know, a relatively pretty rich country, we want to see our humanitarian and our refugee program expanded to, I think it's 20, 27, 27, 27, 000, yeah. Yeah, which is very doable. You know. And we could do it through uh, community support groups. There's some work already being done with community support for refugees and that can be expanded and grow but they really need our politicians, those who have been elected into positions of power to really get behind that and support that. In Canada it's been working for 40 years and they've managed to nurture into the community something like 70,000 refugees from around the world and we can do that here too. In fact, churches are well placed to be to be supporters of of refugees who could who could be part of our community because we're we're actually very well connected people you know, and we have a lot of talent in our churches. Uh, often, some of us have a spare room at home that we've got junk in. Um, <laughs> More than one room. Well, <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, so, so churches can definitely do a lot more. As, as small communities, we, often we don't have thousands of people in our churches, but a community of 40, 50 people can easily support you know, a, a refugee a family or a couple um, to just give them a hand, like the Balawila family, you know, so, so loved by the community. Conscious of Bronwyn sitting just here behind the camera, but she worships at St. Philip's Annerley at the very graciously as a community embraced two refugee families and are supporting them and both of them are in this kind of temporary situation. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you embrace us with love and hospitality, indeed sending your son into this messy world where even though we had somehow walked away from your love and Lord we pray that we too can be a people of generous hospitality, reaching out to those in need, hearing your son's message of neighbourly love and living that in our day-to-day -day lives. Open those hearts wide so that we can see with your eyes, hear with your ears and see people as our brothers and sisters that we can embrace. Make this prayer in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.